All right, so um, I think since I'm being filmed, I'm going to kind of stay here completely, uh, which will be hard for me to do because I like to walk around and interact. But um, I'll, I'll start. Here's kind of the plan today. I'm going to give a quick introduction uh, of Adobe Systems. Most people are probably fairly familiar with you know, some, some Adobe products. But I'll give a little bit of background that's pertinent to how we develop software. Uh, I'll talk about the team that I worked on, at, uh, the first Scrum team at Adobe, um, uh, which was the audio team that, that delivered the audio product audition and sound booth. And then I'll talk about uh, a little bit about how that, uh, that story is starting to spread to other pieces of Adobe in my current role. So um, as far as Adobe, uh, Adobe's uh, um, product development life cycle. So Adobe, as many of you might know, is, is a, a, a company that's really built on acquisitions. So we've, we've acquired many, many different companies to build uh, the, the current company of Adobe. And uh, Adobe is very, uh, because of that, they're very conscious of uh, being respectful of the, the teams that they're acquiring, of, of their own culture and their own development methodologies. And so Adobe has, has never, to this day, said, uh, you know, when you become part of Adobe, here's the life cycle you need to follow. So what we have at Adobe is a, is a dispersed set of groups, all developing software, how are they think is best. And of course, there, there is a little bit of cross-pollinization that happens over time. But uh, different groups uh, tend to use different terminology and, and different life cycles, and it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Um, uh, it has its benefits, of course, because then teams can come in and be immediately productive, and, and they don't feel like the big Adobe is, is trying to uh, uh, affect the way they do things. But Adobe's about, uh, about 7,000 employees right now, um, and uh, we have making about uh, $3 billion a year, doing primarily desktop software, but also software as a service as well. Um, Products like uh, Photoshop, Acrobat, uh, Flash, all pretty uh, well-known products. Um, where I came into this was on, on the audio products, though. And my background was all in audio. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this team, which is the team that developed uh, the first uh, Scrum product. Um, and so the, the history of that team goes all the way back to 1990, uh, when we had one uh, the original founder, Centrillium Software, uh, who, who was at the time working for Microsoft, uh, doing C manufacturing, with me doing coding, uh, but had a background in, in audio acoustics and, and wanted to write a PC audio editor. And so he wrote up this little shareware app that he called Cool Edit and started uh, asking for five dollar donations. And he started to get all these checks and, and he said it was annoying to take all those checks to the bank and so he upped the price to twenty five dollars thinking the check flow would slow down, but the number of checks was about the same and they were just four or five times as much. So he decided he better incorporate and, and he formed this company called Centrillium. Uh, so, you know, throughout the years, various releases of Cool Edit and eventually Adobe, uh, for their video business, was interested in acquiring an audio application to be a companion to their video editors. And, uh, and I, I was working for uh, Centrillium uh, at the time that Adobe acquired Centrillium, so I was one of the acquisitions of, of Adobe. Um, we, uh, we had a couple releases of, of what became on Adobe Audition. It used to be called Cool Edit Pro, and it became Adobe Audition as soon as Adobe bought it. Um, and, and I worked on the, the product as a tester. Um, around uh, the, the Audition 2.0 cycle, I became the program manager for Audition. And uh, shortly after that, I heard about Scrum. Since that time, uh, Adobe, or, or the, that audio team has developed uh, three major releases, uh, all using Scrum, as well as uh, a few updates and are, are still using uh, Scrum on that. So let me talk a little bit about Audition 2.0. And this was, the, this was the cycle that I became the program manager on, uh, about in the middle of it. So there were a few issues that we were dealing with on this cycle. This was a major rewrite of both the back end basing engine and to mix all the audio streams together and apply effects and all the fun stuff that you can do in an audio application, as well as we were reskinning the whole front end uh, to make it look like an Adobe application. Uh, until then, we still had kind of the old user interface that, uh, that we had developed as, as our uh, little startup company, and we were making it look like the other applications in the, uh, in the video uh, suites. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the issues that we had there is that the, the fundamental uh, technology that we were relying on to make this new mix engine work really fast to where, you know, if all of you who have turned a knob on a stereo, you expect that, like, it's going to get louder immediately, not that you're going to have to wait two seconds to hear it get louder. And we were experiencing problems like that. So we had to develop a new engine for that. 
The guy that was working on that uh, had been with the company for a long time. Quite frankly, was pretty burned out uh, working on the product. Uh, all of our developers at that time were working from their homes. All of the testers were working in an office together. So it was a, an interesting um, environment we were working at the time. Uh, but uh, I'll call this developer John, who was developing this uh, really key feature, the underlying uh, mix engine. Uh, John, this is the ASIO driver. So I've got a picture of the ASIO, ASIO symbol up there. Uh, the ASIO driver was, was the key thing that was going to allow us to do that real-time mixing. And John had worked on all of our driver development up until that time. And uh, the driver came in, gosh, about we had a, a milestone we called Feature Complete, very similar to like a beta milestone where we stopped working on new feature development and we just started fixing all the bugs that we built in the last, so a very water polish type model at the time. Uh, John delivered that, uh, that, that um, audio driver about two weeks before that feature complete date. And, and he delivered pretty full of bugs at the time. And I remember as, as a tester when this came in, I was pretty freaked out that we were going to have to try and get all these bug fix, bugs fixed in the, in the new engine. Um, so we didn't have very much testing on it prior to that feature complete milestone. And we also had, you can see this is the actual bug curve of uh, bugs that need to be fixed. This is open, two fixed bugs is how we classify them. Uh, this is the actual curve, uh, shape of the curve, and you can see, you can guess where a feature complete happened, right? Uh, right at the top of that mountain there. Um, because of that big mountain, it was a pretty rough end game, and we barely made our schedule as, as you know, a newly acquired Adobe application. We had to ship at the same time as all the other products. It was a, uh, it was a new experience for us. So we barely made that. Um, this, this bottom picture down here is, uh, we found out after the fact, uh, you know, one of those times where somebody accidentally hit reply to all, when they meant to like reply to all person. We found out that John was spending quite a bit of time building this great new home theater. We thought he was developing the ASIO driver. Um, so, so, a, so a few personnel issues that we were dealing with as well. And of course, you know, John's manager was working with him to do a better job of those things, but it's uh, not having a lot of success with that. Um, so all these things were happening. Uh, and, and I was a new program manager at Adobe, and I remember going to like a brown bag, lunch times, hour-long presentation from Jeff Sutherland. And Jeff was saying things like, you know, in Scrum, we develop things in priority order, or feature priority order, or, or, you know, based on the customer, or based on risk. And I remember thinking, oh, if we did that, the ASIO driver would have been done like in the first couple of months. That would have been great. And then he said, in Scrum, uh, what we have is we have all the people on the team working together and they, they meet once a day for a daily scrum and they answer questions like, what did you work on yesterday? And I thought, oh, if John had to answer what he worked on yesterday, what's he gonna say? Well, I got my new receiver hooked up. <laughs> um, and, and so I was pretty excited about hearing about scrum and it just seemed to really resonate with me as, as a better way to do things. So I read, you know, I read Ken's books and I, uh, I got online and, and, and learned all I could about scrum and, and then um, I wrote up a little, you know, presentation to the other managers in, in my team saying, I think this is a good way to do things, and I think our next release, we should try this, this new development methodology, this Scrum thing. They agreed, uh, they, they, they uh, um, you know, with a few bumps along the way, but everybody finally agreed that, yeah, we're going to give this thing a shot, and we got buy-in from our direct uh, executives directly over us to try this on the product. And so myself, the engineering manager, went to Ken's two-day Scrum training uh, back in, I guess, 2006. Uh, and then we brought in a local uh, trainer, Alan Shalloway, who works at a company called NetObjectives, to do some training for the team uh, with various varying levels of success, depending on who you talk to. Um, and and we, we kicked it off. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that happened in, over the course of that cycle, but I want to talk about a little bit of the results that we had. There were four areas that really changed when we moved to Scrum. Uh, the first is in code quality. The second one was in our ability to focus on what the customers really want. Uh, the, this, you know, kind of buzz term productivity, which I'll talk about, and then teamwork. So I'm going to talk about the, the results that we got over, over time. So the green line, you might remember that first curve, which is the audition 2.0 cycle. Uh, the next curve is, is the cycle we use from. So you can see that we have about a third the number of bugs to fix over the cycle. And very similar um, release times. These are 18 month releases. So the creative suite all releases on these 18 months to two year cycles. So we were fitting into that time box. And you can see that you know we still had a little bit of a hill that we climbed, uh, and it was a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because we said, well, we're trying this new thing, but we're not going to really modify these milestones like feature complete. We're not going to, you know, it, what if this thing blows up? We don't want to. We don't want to have feature development up until the last month, and then it blows up, and 
we don't have good quality. And so we built in this, this uh, what we call an end game, you know, where we're fixing bugs. And you know, in that sprint, right before feature complete, we were saying, wow, we'd really like to get more features in. And, uh, and, and we were saying, we have these, you know, our, our bug count is one third of what it's been, the same team size, but um, gosh, maybe we, should, maybe we should let quality slip a little bit, get a few more features in this time, because what are we gonna do in those five months? <laughs> so it was a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that we had still a, a bit of a bug curve, but still, if you look at the cycle, cycle improvement, way better, right? Um, the customer focus area is, uh, because we were at the end of every sprint, we had complete features that we could uh, show to customers. We were able to go out both to uh, private beta, um, you know, not the NDA signed beta testers that were able to use these features and give us feedback very early on on the direction of the product. Um, but then we were also able to do a public beta. And in fact, we had talked about doing a public release, um, a public beta release of, of this new software called uh, uh, Soundboost, which is another audio product targeted at different users. Yeah. Um, and originally in the, in the planning phase of that product, we said, you know what, it's too risky. We don't know what the product's gonna look like by that point. We don't know what, what the value is. And so we had decided, both as a team and had, had an executive client not to do it. Well, we got uh, eight or nine months into it, and Adobe, for various reasons, which I can go into if you want to ask later, but we're going you know, to try and compress this a little bit. Adobe said, you know what, we want you to do a public beta. And in fact, we want you to have it ready for the Max conference, which is in three weeks. And uh, I said, well, we had no plans on doing a public beta. And he said, yeah, I know, but, but we really need you to do one. And so luckily we were at the end of a sprint, and in fact, if we were to go back to this bug curve, see that little peak right above 250 days? This, these are both backdated from our ship days. Um, that little peak right there is where they asked us to do it. And so we were at less, you know, very, very low bug counts, and we had just finished a sprint. And so we said, well, gosh, can we do this? I think maybe we could. In this next sprint, we could say the goal for the sprint is to get public beta. We had to do all kinds of things like legal reviews and stuff like that. Removing a codex where, like the MP3 codec, Brownhopper wants a lot of money anytime somebody downloads it. And for a free product, we said, well, that's probably not a good idea to we're paying Brownhopper for a free product. So we removed the Brownhopper codex, things like that. Uh, but we were able to, within three weeks, turn that around and say, okay, here's your public beta build, and then get that up on left. If we were to look at the audition, same contract and audition, if we had had a request like that, no way could we have responded because of the bug count, number one. But number two, the features that we had were all these kind of half-developed things, right, that culminated finally in feature complete where everything worked. Uh, no way would we have had something that was uh, uh, a cohesive set of features uh, that we could have gotten feedback on. So we were able to go out and get that public feedback, which was extremely valuable to the team as well. I mentioned productivity. so. Uh, the, this uh, term end game is what we call it internally, where, where we stop doing things like adding value, you know, new functionality, and start doing things like just fixing all the bugs we've created. Um, over an 18 month cycle, the, the standard delta for us was five months that we spent fixing bugs. And I mentioned that for the, the CS3 cycle, we said we're not going to alter that. We're going to say five months is what we're going to do, uh, just in case things, you know, just in case this thing doesn't work. Uh, well, we got to that, uh, to that feature complete date, as you saw, we had one third of the bug count. And so as a management team, we were sitting around at a table saying, what are we going to do, you know? Um, should, we, should we just say, oh, well, we're going to fix bugs for five months, even though we don't have that many, we'll get done early, or start working on the next release, what should we do? And most of us said, you know, we want to get more features into this product, you know, uh, let's, let's do that. But our very, um, our very conservative QA manager on the team said, ah, I think that you know we've been doing these sprints where we're laser focused on individual features, and we haven't really been focusing on the whole thing. He said, I think that when we get to feature complete, we're going to start these big workflow tests, and I bet we're going to turn up all kinds of bugs that we didn't see before. Now, most of the people on the, on the uh, both on the team and in the management had been playing with the application, and it felt pretty solid. And, and we were saying, really? I don't know if you agree, but we said, all right, here's our compromise. Let's do one sprint, and in that sprint, we'll all focus on regression testing, workflow testing, and let's see what happens. Maybe you're right, and the bug count's gonna skyrocket once we start doing lots of focus testing. And maybe we're right, and this thing's really stable, it's gonna go down, and if I were to you know, rewind back here to this graph, you can see that we hit our feature complete day. We did that first sprint of regression testing, and it actually started going down. It was, it was you know, uh, as, as most of us expected. And so what we agreed to is, let's add one more sprint then of feature development. So we were able to, to squeeze uh, we were doing four-week sprints, 
uh, we were able to squeeze one more month of future development out of that cycle above what we had originally planned. For CS4, we were able to release that, reduce that down to three months. And for the next version that, that we're currently working on, the plan is to do a two month. So cycle over cycle, we're getting more and more time of actual future development. So I mentioned that I wanted to tell a little bit of, of how the adoption went for us. Um, and so I have three sprint burndown charts here to talk about. They tell a bit of the story and, and they talk about retrospectives a little bit and, and how retrospectives were extremely powerful for our team in, in uh, making this work for us. Uh, so this, uh, this first sprint burndown, you can see uh, some pretty telltale signs. Right? First of all, the thing's flatlining for the first two, three weeks of the sprint. Um, and, uh, and then at some point we say, gosh, I guess we're really not going to make it. You know, at this point, the team was still at the point where they're saying, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. You know, if we just really buckle down, we're going to get this stuff. We're going to get these tasks marked off and we'll make it. And then finally, like a week before the, the, re the uh, review, you know, reality says, I guess we're not going to do it. So, you know, we pulled a, a um, user story off of that sprint, put it back in the backlog, and say, all right, the product owner, we're not going to get to that one this time, and, and try to get the rest of them done. And you can see that even doing that, um, deferring those things that have back into the product backlog, we still didn't quite make it. Right? You can see there's still a little bit of work to do at the end of this, and almost certainly that little bit of work was test this, fix this bug, right? a little bit of the, the last little pieces of work. So we had a retrospective at the end of this sprint. And what came out of that retrospective was this idea that you know if we're gonna if, if we're not if we're overcommitted for a sprint, number one, let's be more careful about what we commit to in the sprint. Let's maybe reduce our expectations a little bit. But number two, if we know three days into it, four days into it, a week into it, that we're not gonna make it, let's let's put it back in the product backlog right then. Let's go to the product owner and say this isn't gonna make it, put it back in the product backlog, and and really focus on getting the rest of the stuff done so that we can get down to zero at the end of our sprint. So that was our plan for sprint number two. And you can see that there were a few points in here where the team said, well, we're committed, put that thing back in the product backlog. A couple of times they did that. And yet they still didn't quite make it down to zero right, at the end of the sprint. The team was pretty frustrated with this retrospective, this uh, sprint eight retrospective. They were saying, you know, we tried this thing, we thought it was going to work, it didn't work. You know, what are we going to do differently? And we started talking about how we do things on our team. And a few issues came up. So sprint seven and eight are kind of represented by these these uh, these little holes. Now any any uh, set of feature development is going to go through a natural arc. These are very, of course, um, abstract versions of this. But there's going to be some analysis, some coding, some testing. All, all these whatever the phases are, right? Uh, maybe some testing, some coding, depending on how it works. But um, on our team, we were we were doing things like doing the design, then then the, the coding, and then black box testing on the end of that. And uh, there was this reluctance on the part of some of the developers to check things in until they were, you know, the whole thing was done. That whole feature for that sprint was done. Then I'll check it in. Because, and this was the reason they said, I don't want QA writing bugs on stuff that's not done. Right? Uh, so you can see right away there's a little bit of a trust issue already, a uh, communication issue. What we talked about was, hey, maybe what we should do is check in like every day. Whatever progress you've made, check it in. And then, and then talk to your tester counterpart and say, hey, here's what I've done. Here's what's ready to be tested. You know, we're talking every day. Let's make use of that meeting. And, uh, and, and the testing guys agree, hey, we're not going to write bugs on stuff that you haven't done yet. Don't worry about that. That's, that's in the past. We're working together here. Uh, and so instead of doing these big sets of features, we broke things down into uh, very small pieces of functionality. Uh, from a UI standpoint, it might be something like add this little checkbox, or from a from a backend standpoint, it might be add the support for this sample rate for audio files. Right? Very small, little, tiny increments of functionality, and those would get checked in and tested, so that there were a, a much faster feedback loop. Also, you can see that as you do that, you get you have many more opportunities to say this is the right amount of scope for this user story, or is it this amount of scope? Is which one actually solves the problem? As soon as we solve the problem, let's not do all those other details. I don't know if you've ever used uh, Adobe products, you probably know they're way over-engineered. Uh, the Adobe guy standing here saying, yes, our products are way over-engineered. They do many more things than almost anybody needs. Not good at the 80-20 rule at Adobe. Uh, and so we said, let's just stop. Let's just stop doing those last two little bumps, maybe, if this thing's already solving the user story. And especially at the ends of sprints, we could use that and say, 
you know what, we got uh, three days left on the sprint, I could add support for this new thing, or I could stop, and we could actually get everything tested and, and all the bugs fixed for these last couple of days. And I'd see emails going out like this saying, what do you want me to do? Um, so this was, our, this was our, our, our kind of discovery, the sprint retrospective. And so the, the mantra that came out of that was, as we're in the sprint planning meeting, for every little coding task, the question was going to be, and how are we going to test that? Because some of the things, we had uh, one white box tester out of 20, uh, out of 10 testers, uh, and the rest were all black box, so they didn't have a lot of code expertise. These were people that had a lot of customer expertise. They knew what audio people wanted, and they were verifying from that standpoint. And so we had to say, how am I going to test this? And our developers would have to say, oh, good question. I hadn't thought about you're going to test this little tiny subset of functionality. And so what, what really happened is the team kind of self-discovered test-driven development. Because we're having those discussions in the, in the sprint planning meeting and then throughout uh, the sprint. Every time some new thing was going to come in, the thought popped up, okay, how are we going to test this? So we broke things down into much smaller increments and made them test-driven. Um, and you can see that the, the burn down for sprint nine was much better, right? You can see it's actually a much more natural curve um, and, and that it's, uh, it actually got down to zero. So this is just kind of a story of how on our team, retrospectives were really valuable to us. If we had hired somebody to come in and say, you know, I see that you're not getting done at the end of sprints, and I think test driven development is the solution to your problem, and I'm going to train it. Never would have happened, right? Everybody would have said, oh, yeah, sure, right? Um, working on their iPods or their iPhones while they while they're doing stuff. Um, the fact that the team self discovered it, came up on their own, made it very powerful for the team. So that's kind of the story of, of uh, Soundbooth. That was the first release of Soundbooth. Certainly didn't do everything right. The, the next burn down after sprint nine probably had more problems, you know, if I were to show all of them. Um, but that was, that was one um, small success on, on that uh, team. At the end of that cycle, the, the kind of the data that I was just showing you, we're reducing our regression testing time. We're reducing our bug count significantly. We're able to get, you know, respond very quickly to what our executives want. Those stories started making around the company. And it's always a pretty grassroots kind of thing as far as development goes, like I mentioned before. There's nobody telling the teams how to do it. And so those stories started kind of getting around. You know, that, that uh, hey, here's a team that did it this way. In fact, I was sitting at a, a major uh, review of the creative suite, because after I did Soundbooth, uh, I got a promotion to be the group program manager for creative suite. So I went from this small agile team to the creative suite, which is 1,200 developers developing 14 major point products and trying to manage that process. It was like you know, going from sprinting to running in molasses. It's an interesting experience personally. But um, uh, right after that, uh, these, these other teams, I, I was at this review, and the CEO was asking somebody, hey, can you go to public beta? Can you go to public beta in X number of months? And the executive said, well, I don't think we can get there in time. I think it's going to take us this number of months. And the CEO said, well, Soundbooth did it. What were they using? And, and, it, and it kind of went down the chain. Yeah, Joe, what were they using? And it went down to the director. Yeah, uh, what was it called, Peter? It's Scrum. Scrum, Scrum. And it kind of went up back through the chain. And, and Bruce Jizz and the CEO kind of said, yeah, they're using Scrum. Why don't you look into that? <laughs> um, so those stories started making their way around. And, and um, because I had been the program manager on that team, people started asking me, hey, okay, what, uh, can you tell us more about this Scrum thing? And so I put together a little presentation, you know, and, PowerPoint slides and, and started talking about what we had done and what Scrum is and and over time, in fact, over that uh, that CS4 release, I had more and more people asking me about it. There's more interest in the company in what Scrum could do for these teams. So we started bringing Ken Schreiber in to do two day, you know, his two days Scrum master training and and he did five of those over the course of a year where where it was really a poll situation where if I get enough people that were willing to pay Ken's fee, I, I organize it and we, we kick it off and. And then I helped Ken train because what we found was that Ken would come in and say, here's the, here's the, the you know, what, what Mike Flynn calls the Dow is from, right? Here's the philosophy behind it. And teams would be very skeptical and say, I don't see how this could work at my company. And then if I stood up and said, and now here's how we did it at this company, then everybody would say, oh, I guess we could do it here. And they would kind of, you know, open the, open the shackles a little bit and say, yeah, let's figure out how we can make this thing work for our, for our team. So we brought Ken in, and, and then uh, at the end of the cycle, I, I, uh, I moved into a full-time role of just training teams because there was so much demand. There was kind of this pent up demand. It's very expensive. The uh, I'm very cheap, relatively, for a uh, for a dummy to hire. Uh, and so I moved into a full-time role of just coaching teams. 
And so I've, I've been able to see kind of the rollout of Scrum at the company, and it's been completely a pull. There's been no push. And what we do, uh, I, I work for, uh, for a group called the Adobe Quality Initiative. And there's different, there's kind of different best practice people in that. There's somebody who's a big peer review advocate and, and can go on and talk about how peer reviews have helped teams. And that's all they do is they give examples of, you know, here's a team that used peer reviews and they were able to reduce their defects in the QA by X percent. And then people are interested in about it and they might bring them down and do some training. So things like uh, peer reviews and, and there's a, a big TSP guy uh, involved in that as well. And so it's really just a poll to say, are you interested in this stuff? Cool, we'll come train you on it. And over time, our goal is to, to kind of just spread these best practices, things that have worked well with the company. Um, so since that time, I've trained a lot of teams in Scrum. Um, we're definitely following this, this standard tech adoption curve um, that, uh, that Ever Rogers described, um, where today we're, we're kind of in the early majority stages at Adobe, where we have about 25% of, uh, of product development. And I think that number is probably bigger. About every quarter, I send out a big email blast to say, hey, is your team using Chrome? You know, what's your team size? I'm trying to gather some data. Um, and this, I'm about to do that again. I'm, I'm pretty sure this number will go up. Uh, so some of, the, uh, some of the team sizes, the lifecycle team is one of the teams that uses it to enterprise um, uh, software. The lifecycle team is probably the biggest Scrum team in Adobe. They have about 300 developers across about uh, 50 Scrum teams. Uh, the, uh, the audition team that I work on is about 20 developers. So you can see there's various team sizes, um, both dispersed, distributed. Um, our, the assembly team was, was uh, a distributed team where we had a, a homework group with about six people and 14 in Seattle. And we gave them their own chunk of stuff to work on. Um, we're, we're in the process of trying to tool up, you know, deciding on different tools because I always get that question, oh, what tools should I use? You know, so, you know, uh, Adobe's actually working on their own internal as well as lots of teams using you know the various tools that are out there. So um, I mentioned that uh, that earlier this year I, I sent out a, a Scrum survey and I kind of had two goals for that survey. The first one is there's this big question uh, in the Agile community, which is are you actually doing Agile? Are you actually doing Scrum? And what does that mean, right? And so I wanted to, to try and get a feel for you know when when I hear oh such and such team is using Scrum at Adobe. I kind of want to get a feel for what they actually mean by that. Uh, I'll hear some teams doing that, and it just means they're having stand-up every day. And as far as they're concerned, that means they're doing Scrum. And I hear some teams doing it, and, and they're not doing anything like that. And they have you know, very uh, command and control structures in place. So I, I wanted to come up with uh, kind of a, uh, that information, like are you actually doing this? And then number two, what effect is that actually having on the team as far as bug counts, productivity, features that you're able to deliver to cut? to customers, how the team feels about it, um, you know, is this, is this a good way to work? And so there's kind of two parts to the survey that we're, that we're um, going out. And I send it out with no incentives, you know, sometimes we'll send it out with, we'll get your Amazon gift card or one out, you know, in the draw. We send out with no, no incentive. We base kind of the, are you doing it on the no-kit test, although this, um, I don't know, I have some issues with, with some of the questions on it, so we modified a little bit the no-kit test, if you're familiar with that. Um, and we had about 30 people respond, and that's across 21 product teams. Almost all of them were in their first year of Scrum adoption, so it's a pretty skewed uh, viewpoint of Scrum. But, but here's some of the data that we found. Um, this is this is these are the questions that um, that you know how does this affect your team? So uh, you know what I, I would ask a question like, has the product you know quality improved since implementing Scrum on a scale of one to ten, zero to ten? We're using net promoter scores. And, and uh, you know, the, these are the initial results in the first pass of this. Uh, I'll be very curious if I can send this, this test out again uh, later this month. I'll be very curious to see as these teams have now had another four months of, of development or sprints under their belts, whether things are getting better on some teams, getting worse on some teams, how things are going. Um, the, uh, the kind of Nokia test questions, which is are you actually doing it, some pretty poor numbers on here scale from 0 to 10. So if you look at the Nokia test, you can figure out what these things actually mean. But some pretty poor responses on here about, you know, are, are we actually doing it? And this, again, this seems in our first year. Uh, but out of 100, the, the average Adobe score, I talked about uh, Aaron and Gertie Long, the average Adobe score, Adobe score is about 58. But interestingly, I, I asked this question, so it's solely up to you, would you keep doing strong on your team? And 82% of people said yes. So even though there are some issues with, with the implementation and, and with how things are going, um, that the great majority of people still like a better way to work than what they were doing before. Um, 
if I if I filter that set of results by since you're just using it for a, uh, more than a year, uh, it's a smaller sample size, so it's a grain of salt for that. But but uh, there's a much more positive. 100% of those people that responded said, "Yeah, I keep doing it." Um, the interestingly enough, the Nokia test scores were almost identical if you do the, the overall rollup, but the individual areas that they responded high on were much different. So the teams that were doing it for longer than a year had really high scores on things like uh, self-management and uh, product owner, those types of things. So they had the vision, they were able to deliver on it. Maybe their sprint legs were too long. Maybe other things were going wrong, or wrong, I guess, not, not following the by the book strong. Um, but overall, uh, overall those, those teams that have been doing it a longer time were really positive. And of course, they're going to self-select out of that as well, because if they're having a really negative experience with it, they're going to stop doing Scrum and stop, stop doing my survey. So they self-select out of that a little bit. But these are the results for, for how those teams felt Scrum had impacted these areas. So teams doing it longer than a year felt that the quality was much higher, that uh, communication was better, that the overall product, the overall product is like, we deliver a better product for our customers. You know, how does this affect our customers? Uh, is, is my work-life balance better since you use Scrum? All those things pretty significantly higher. So we'll wrap it up there because we're about out of time, and I'll take any questions. Okay. Um, yeah, um, in, in your stand-ups, do you have the uh, development manager participate? If so, how, how do you get past the programmers feeling like they're being watched yeah. every day kind of uh -huh. thing? Uh, I've seen both sides of that. On, on the, so the question is, uh, do we have managers participating in the, in the daily scrums and the stand-ups, and how do we get away from the command and control implications that that has? Uh, so I've seen, since I, since I worked on one team, you know, as a scrum master for, for an 18-month cycle, and then I've coached many other teams, I've seen both. So on the audio team, we actually had our managers were just members of the scrum team. They actually were, you know, delivering code, testing code, whatever their role was, at, at a, admittedly at a much smaller uh, contribution than the other one. Uh, and so they felt like they were vested. And those were also pretty good managers already as far as not being command and control people. So it's a personality thing. They, they were very successful doing that. Our engineering manager was very egalitarian, uh, very open to ideas about how to do things, but also not afraid to say, hmm, what about this? You know, Not afraid to give leadership where it was appropriate. So he was really good at balancing that. I have seen uh, some teams that have gone to Scrum, they, their managers didn't want to be on the team like that, and yet they still wanted to be in the daily Scrum. And, and we had some issues on some teams where, you know, at the retrospectives, things like that would turn up, say, how come so-and-so QA manager is always telling me what to do at the end of the uh, daily Scrum? And, and luckily those teams have been, or those, those managers have been very open to that feedback in the retrospectives. And I think it's, it's helped to have me there as kind of an outsider that they can say, Hey, is this the right way to do it? You know, or, or should we should we do it a different way? So having an outside perspective has been valuable, I think, there, so that people felt like they could go to somebody and say, "Why are they asking these questions?" And I could say, "Hey, managers, remember when we said this is self-managing? You may be overstepping that a little bit." Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you kind of dis your team kind of discovered test-driven development uh, along the process. Could you kind of explain what that looked like? Was it more of an acceptance testing, a unit testing? How many tests did you? Yeah. Write? The question is what type of test. It was acceptance test-driven development. During the sprint planning, we we get a long list of acceptance tests for any piece that we were doing, and, and that's what that actually dictated the development order and everything, as opposed to unit tests. We were developing unit tests harness at the same time, but that was that was not. That wasn't our goal as a medium tester. Question here? Yeah, out of the three roles of uh, Scrum Master team and product owner, which ones do you think were the most defined and grew the most, and which ones do you think were the most problematic and didn't? I'm particularly in interested in the product owner role and maybe how that worked at Adobe. Okay, and the question is uh, uh, the various Scrum roles, the three roles, uh, um, and how those developed at Adobe. Um, the first two Scrum pro projects, that my, my project and then another one that, that grew up out of a similar, uh, some, in the same organization that heard about ours, both had just fabulous product owners. So we had a really good start. Um, as, it, as it grew to many teams, what I saw was that not everybody had these great product managers that were really visionary and really good at communicating to the team what they wanted. And one of the things that's been mentioned in some of the other sessions is that the, uh, the, the long-term vision can get really lost easily. 
Uh, and so I would see teams saying, well, we only need to have user stories for the next sprint to find. That's all we need and we can, we can start doing Scrum. And I would get in and say, wait, you don't, have, you don't know what your release is going to do? And they would, they would ask, answer executive questions like, you know, when are you going to ship? And they'd say, we don't know that because we're using Scrum. And then I had to like, you know, dive on the trees and no, that's not what it means, right? Um, and, and explain that no, we actually do do product planning and, and you know, portfolio planning in, in Scrum and here's how it works, you know, it comes down and you, you can use Mycomes planning on you, right, at the various levels of planning. Uh, so that was an area that, that uh, uh, there, was, there were some bumps along the road once we started to scale up to a, a broad set of product owners uh, instead of just the the lucky few that we started with, where we, we got lucky, you know, and had the right right people in place. Other questions? Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>